my personal motivation to become a human rights defender uh, it's really, uh, I would say, in, in twofold. Uh, one would be my uh, personal experience, uh, really uh, witnessing uh, various, various, uh, the, well, that's various occurrences um, uh, as a child. Uh, I, I lost, when I lost my dad uh, at the age of eight, I observed, even though I was very young, but I, I, I observed that certain treatments that my mom received uh, were, were, were inhuman uh, and uh, were gross violation of her rights as a woman. And, and there, even as a child, I made a resolve to, uh, to try to speak for this class of people who are completely vulnerable in the system. And, and in, in, in Nigeria particularly, you have various uh, issues with uh, widowhood, uh, harmful widowhood practices. And so I witnessed this as, as, as a child. And then later on, uh, after I had um, started studying law, in, in my final year, I picked uh, in, the most interest in international human rights law because uh, a lot of the things were things I could identify with personally. But I, I would say that the, the defining moment for me was uh, during my youth service, what we call the National Youth Service in, in Nigeria. I was posted by the government to to serve, it was a mandatory one year service after your graduation. So I was posted to serve at the, the Legal Aid Council of Nigeria. And while working there, uh, one of the things we did was to provide free legal services to, to um, indigent Nigerians, regardless of uh, whatever offense, civil, criminal, um, whatever type of cases. And it, it dawned on me that uh, various, that, majority of persons who are in prisons are those who cannot afford the, the services of a lawyer. And at, at that point, uh, I, it was obvious to me that really the justice system was for the rich. It was designed in such a way that we favor the, the rich and uh, we had these countless thousands of persons in prisons and they had no one to speak for them. Uh, they could not afford to uh, to be able to pay for um, quality legal representation. They had to rely on a fresh law graduate as was provided then by um, the Legal Aid Council and uh, really not much experienced lawyers and uh, not well motivated lawyers. And uh, at that point, uh, I, I knew that this is what I wanted to do. I wanted to speak for, for the voiceless. I wanted to, to try to, to do my part to reform the criminal justice uh, system in Nigeria, which is deeply flawed. I, I would say that uh, we uh, working as a human rights defender, a, a woman as a, working as a, a human rights defender in Nigeria as a woman has been it's been interesting uh, because on one hand, especially when you go out to engage with stakeholders, um, I've, I've I've, 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 I would say that in my case, I've been received very well and uh, taken very seriously. But I've come across uh, a lot of women who would say that uh, because of their gender, they, 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 they've experienced some setback. But I would say that in, in my case, uh, I, have not, uh, I have not experienced that. But maybe that is also because of my resolve not to uh, pay attention to that. I, I, I know that the task that I have is a very serious one. And uh, so I look beyond uh, those kind of barriers to ensure that my voice is heard and, and, and I go out of my way to push to ensure that uh, as a human rights defender, I'm, I'm, I'm seen and, 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 and heard for what I represent, not uh, for my gender. So with this, I, I would say that um, I, I've been able to, uh, to, to move forward, I hope, uh, to make the, the impact in the little way that I can, regardless of, 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 of my gender. In, in Africa, but of course I must say that uh, we are in a system that is deeply uh, uh, patriarchal, I must say, and uh, is a male-dominated society, uh, even in the political sector. So when you go to various states, most of the stakeholders that I engage in, uh, I engage with, are, are men. Uh, and uh, sometimes um, uh, I, I would like to engage with men, but also with women. I would like to engage with women who are also in, in positions of authority, 
to decision makers. But but the reality is that uh, at the moment, uh, everywhere you go, when I go to prisons to get authorization, I have to deal with men. When I, I you know go to the Ministry of Justice, uh, most of the attorney generals that I've, I've interacted with uh, are, are men, and I haven't yet come across a commissioner of police in the course of my work uh, who is a woman. That there, there may be one, but maybe not in one of the states where where I currently engage. And uh, and this, uh, of course, could uh, could uh, bring about some barriers. And then uh, I must say, okay, also on the security part, uh, one of the last visits that I had to a notorious detention center is for, notorious for for using torture. It's called the SAS unit in one of the states. Uh, as as I walked in there, uh, I couldn't help uh, feel also uh, vulnerable because I was in stag. I was given a really hostile uh, reception at, at the gate by, uh, you know, um, security agencies who were welding uh, various amounts of, uh, of, of, of uh, weapons that obviously had life ammunition in them. And here was a young woman who's coming to talk about the issue of torture. Of course, they don't want to uh, listen or listen to that type of, of discussion, but I, I always have to rise above uh, those kind of uh, limitations. Uh, I try not to think about myself as a woman. When I do my work, I, I focus on the, on the work. But on the other hand, I, I believe also that it helps um, the victims, especially those that are women, uh, to, 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 it gives them a voice. It helps them also when they see me. It's, it's, it's easier for them to, to relax and to, to open up to us and, and also to have some hope. My work has, to a large extent, uh, influenced my, my personal life because uh, everywhere I go, I'm very much aware of the, of the, uh, of the impunity that is going on and uh, the, the mistreatment that uh, people receive, uh, the injustices going on being perpetrated by security agencies. So I, I would say that to, to some extent, yes, uh, it's had a huge impact uh, in my personal life, and uh, they're, they're assessing uh, amendments and adjustments that I had to make to, to, to my lifestyle to be able to ensure that I, I, I focus purely on, on the work. No, I've never stopped of talk, I've never actually thought of, uh, of stopping for any reason. Rather, I, I, I uh, have reasons every day to want to do more, to want to go beyond the thematic areas where we are working on. When you hear about uh, extrajudicial killings that are going on and, and, and no one is being held to account. I want to stand up to voice for the, the, the families of the victims. We want to ensure that um, uh, the policing and, and if these security agencies become more proactive and not reactive, well, they, they, they learn to engage, uh, use other forms of techniques to to carry out investigation other than resorting to uh, forced, uh, coerced uh, confessional statements. I, I, I've never uh, stopped. I've never thought of, of, of thing, oh, I've never actually thought of stopping. Rather, every day in Nigeria, we have various reasons that, uh, that make me want to do more beyond myself, beyond my ability, actually. Yes, I see signs of improvement. It's slow very slow because we are dealing with something uh, that is endemic in the system. So yes, there are changes. Uh, for example, in, in 2014, we, uh, we, re we, we issued a press release on the occasion of uh, uh, um, the day set aside uh, by the United Nations to mark uh, the uh, victims, the World Day, in support of victims of torture in, in June. And one of the things that we did in, in 2014 was to highlight that uh, with just one lawyer engaged on our project, we were able to represent 20 victims of torture in Enugu State. And indeed, all 20 of them had gunshot wounds. Now, this was unprecedented in our work in Nigeria, and we highlighted that in that press release. Uh, but fast forward to um, 2018, uh, we are still working in the same state, and uh, um, at the last count in, in November, we had only about three victims of torture that had gunshot wounds. 
Now, that is not to say that torture has gone away uh, completely, no. But you can see that uh, as a result of uh, the accountability aspect of our project, pushing back, uh, monitoring, and also being vocal on the issue of torture, uh, we can see um, a change and also reduction in excesses being used by security agencies. So yes, uh, there are changes. It's coming slowly, but definitely there are changes. I am optimistic about uh, the future of human rights in Nigeria. I'm optimistic that someday uh, uh, perpetrators of torture would have their day in court and will be convicted and, and, and the, the, the right punishment uh, meted out to them. So far, no one has been uh, actually sentenced to any time of, of imprisonment for the offense of torture. I'm also very much op optimistic that someday the laws uh, regarding the death penalty will be reviewed in Nigeria. Uh, it, it, would take, it would take a long time for sure. It would take some time, but definitely it's going to happen.